Next, Tim Olson will present systemic management of acute retinal artery occlusions. Thank you, Larry, Carolyn. Um, Stephen just did a beautiful job on presenting the OTAs. In my role as Secretary for Quality for the American Academy, the other entity that we overlook are the preferred practice patterns, or PPPs. And when we did the PPP on retinal artery occlusions, we believe that there may be an inflection point on how we manage these patients. I have no direct financial interest in this topic. I walk by this photograph every day at the Mayo Clinic. This is 1971 faculty members. And one of these faculty members presented 60 years ago this case of a 52-year-old laborer who had transient visual symptoms of the right eye, flew by airliner to the Mayo Clinic, and was treated with heparin and Coumadin. Interestingly, our treatment has not changed in 60 years. Visual acuity was 20-20 in both eyes. Retinal diastolic pressure is normal. This is a plaque that was noted in the first order arterial. Two days later, a distal portion of the plaque moved upstream. Two days later, further upstream. And then in, uh, several weeks later, it had mostly resolved. Um, this person on the far right uh, published this finding in JAMA, 1961, uh, R.W. Hollenhorst, who was at the Mayo Clinic, and that's where the eponym originates. So I'd also like to present a 47-year-old male, a younger person who had constricted visual fields in the right eye, 20-20 vision in both eyes, trace right relative afferent pupillary defect. There's his left eye. Here's his right eye. He has a central retinal artery occlusion with ciliary retinal artery sparing. In fluorescein angiogram, you can see perfusion of the ciliary retinal artery only and some box carring in the retinal arterioles. So in younger patients, you have to consider systemic vasculitis. A 70-year-old female presents with sudden onset of superior vision loss in her right eye, 2040-2030. This is her left eye. Her right eye, she has an inferior branch retinal artery occlusion with swelling of the optic nerve. OCT shows inner retinal thickening consistent with a diagnosis of an artery occlusion. So the number one important thing is that ophthalmologists are required to make this diagnosis. Monoc transient mon or acute monocular vision loss, amaurosis fugax, does not always equate with ret retinal artery occlusion. And the systemic workup is long, but I would argue our job is to get number one, sed rate C-reactive protein. You want to make sure we rule out giant cell arteritis and a systemic vasculitis. So what's the treatment? It's controversial. So Hayray sets the platform for this discussion when he occluded the arteries of primates. And by 97 minutes after the occlusion, you could get reversible recovery of neurosensory retina, while by 240 minutes, or roughly four hours later, there was irreversible loss of the retina. So that's our time frame. In 2013, an important announcement was made by the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association, which defines an ischemic stroke as an episode of neurologic dysfunction caused by focal cerebral, spinal, or retinal infarction. So a artery occlusion of the retina is a stroke. Uh, in 1995, treatment of stroke was delivered with uh, tissue plasminogen activator to dissolve the clot. The Best study comes out of Europe for treating artery occlusions of the eye, and this was the Eagle study in 2010. There were 82 patients randomized from nine centers over five years, and the average time to onset of symptoms to treatment was 13 hours, well beyond Hay Ray's time frame, and their conclusion was they do not show any definitive benefit of intraarterial uh, local fibrinolysis. This was used using an intraarterial catheter. So inconclusive study as far as what do we do with treatments. How about conservative treatments? We all know the drill of these conservative therapies. Well, there's a meta-analysis that was published in 2017 which shows that the natural history in 396, what percent will spontaneously cover? That is 2,200 at presentation to getting better than 2,100. 18% spontaneously improve. How about with those conservative therapies, digital massage, et cetera? 419 patients, you think it's a lot better? 7%. So we're not doing much. How about thrombolysis? And this is retrospective, so this is, the numbers get smaller, 30% and TPA in those under four and a half hours, 50%. So, and again, that's retrospective study. 
uh, retrospective studies in the smaller case theory meta-analysis. So conclusion number three, conservative therapies lack any evidence. So in 2018, this meta-analysis was presented for interarterial thrombolysis, and it showed a, perhaps a slight benefit. And again, these are retrospective study meta-analysis. So conclusion number four, thrombolytic th therapy for retinal artery occlusions remains controversial. Here's where we start to think about what we're doing when we, these present to our office. In June of 2014, Valerie Bruce wrote an editorial in AJO saying, are we missing an emergency, an urgent situation? And the data is starting to weigh in to say that may be the case. This began from a Korean study by Lee et al. in June of 2014, where 33 patients who had an artery occlusion, 24% of those had a, had a acute CNS infarction in association with their artery occlusion. 38 of them were completely asymptomatic, where in the past they may not have gotten an MRI scan. In 2015, a group out of Germany, Lada et al., 213 patients, almost an identical number, 24% who also, in, with their arter, retinal artery occlusion, had an acute CNS stroke, 90% were asymptomatic. And then the, the last study out of Korea by Park et al., 1,655 patients, 10% had an associated MI or stroke. The peak was within seven days, and a lot were within 30 days. So here's a graph. That vertical line is the time of the retinal artery occlusion. Within seven days, look at the risk of an MI or a stroke. So when they present to your office, you may be sitting on a time bomb. And the other spots are all around the time of their retinal artery occlusion. So we need to follow stroke guidelines, and these are well laid out in the neurolo neurology literature, and this is in your handout. So if they present with less than 24 hours of acute onset of symptoms, they need to go directly to the emergency department or stroke center. They will get the testing as outlined there. If they're subacute, within one day to 14 days or two weeks, they need to get evaluated in a TI clinic, TIA or a stroke clinic within 48 hours. If they cannot, they need to go to the emergency room for those testing. And if they're more than 14 days out, uh, they can be scheduled in a TIA clinic. And these are a map, this is a map of the stroke centers across the country, so my suggestion is to learn the closest stroke center to you. This is also outlined in the preferred practice patterns. And the last thing we need to be concerned about is the long-term follow-up for iris neovascularization in these retinal artery occlusions, which occurs in 10 to 15 percent of patients. So in summary, retinal artery is a stroke. Consider giant cell arteritis. The stroke team will not recognize that. We need to. Thrombolysis is controversial. We should manage these as a stroke and prioritize urgency and get in touch with the local stroke center or emergency department in advance. Watch for NVI, NVA. Thank you very much.